this is Joel and in this video we will be talking about zero trust now these are going to be my uh, personal views and thoughts on the topic right which I've probably gained analyzing various deployments as well as working on a few hobby projects on the side right that being said um, we will follow the similar format like my earlier videos where we will talk a little bit about the theory right we will try to dissect what zero trust is all about in a very vendor agnostic way and in then the second part what we will do is we will probably pick a lab um, in this case I will actually not be building a lab by myself I'll use a dcloud lab uh, to show some of uh, Cisco solutions which can help you in your journey of zero trust that being said let me pull up my whiteboard here all right so when we talk about zero trust we need to go a little back you know in the history right of the internet so uh, when we think about internet right so internet was solely built or the the requirement right when internet was built was only availability right but you also know um, you know what are the rest of the two important pillars in the whole world of security it is confidentiality and integrity right but there's no fault you know um, uh, I mean you can't really fault them because back in the day uh, there was no requirement to have confidentiality and integrity it was predominantly availability right so because of this if you look at some of the attacks right which we have had over the years let's pick a simple attack right let's pick something like a tcp sync attack right what happens here you basically have a untrusted network then you have a trusted network right and uh, generally uh, organization goes about putting a firewall in the center over here correct and the firewall could be a stateful or a stateless firewall okay now in this tcp sin attack what really happens is you have an untrusted user who is sitting outside right an adversary an attacker right who is going to basically start sending tcp uh, you know uh, floods right tcp sin floods and his uh, objective will be to kind of exhaust all the resources on the server which is sitting on the trusted network right that's that's the whole attack about and you know once you kind of exhaust all the resources the server will not be able to service any legitimate clients right now this is a very common attack you can call it as a DOS attack and this is just one example like I said there are thousands and thousands of ways of doing DOS right using different protocols you can do it with like ping of death right which is using just ICMP right but whatever um, you know attack if you take right you will basically find a pattern and the pattern is that you know the attacks came first and the solutions or the workarounds to fix it obviously came second right so even in this case in case of tcp sin attack what is the way to mitigate this you have something called as rate limiting correct you can rate limit on the firewall right over here so that the firewall will um, basically inspect the tcp sessions which are coming in and then if the number of tcp sessions number of open tcp sessions or half tcp sessions you know increases i say uh, more than 5 10 what you can do is you can set up a threshold right and you can block any further tcp sessions which come right so you can do such kind of mitigation and workarounds to kind of get around this but the point which i'm trying to drive here is that the fixes were developed more as a reactive measure right after suffering the attacks and that's because of a flaw in that's because that's that's mainly because the traditional security model was designed this way right where you have a every organization would basically break their whole network into two pieces one you call as the untrusted network which is mainly the internet and then you have the trusted network right which is like the you know uh, corporate network but will this model really work in today's world right that's the question i'll give you another example right so if you talk about like let's assume the same scenario but this time we have an email right which is coming in right we have a email right email is a very common application used right across organizations right and imagine the email looks fine so the firewall is going to allow it 
right? And the email is going to come inside, the trusted user who is sitting inside, right, is going to click on the email, right? But, but then discovers or, you know, most of the time the user don't discover as well. You click on a link and there is a malware which gets downloaded on your laptop, right? But if you see this scenario here, what has really happened is because you are on the trusted side of things and a malware has already, you know, entered your network, you don't really have any more you know access controls you don't have any firewalls right because you're already on the trusted network the organizations generally think that look i mean it's it's our employees laptop so let's trust them right so as a result you know the malware gets downloaded on the laptop there'll be some kind of c2c right callback uh, or there might be a, it might be a botnet right different types right but the point which I'm driving here is that once once the attacker, once the adversary has entered your network, right, using any of the methods, now they can do what they call as lateral movement, right? So they can quickly laterally move from one, you know, system to the other and exploit and then obviously take advantage of this, right? There are scenarios, you know, where we call as certain things as advanced persistent threat, right? Where the adversary in fact stays in your network for a long period of time and goes undetected, right? Because there is no way to detect because you are you don't really have another firewall here. Everything which is inside the trusted network is already trusted. You assume, you know, that there is not going to be any kind of a data breach, right? So this kind of a model is what has to change in the current, you know, world, right? Having this whole um, scenario where you're like blindly trusting everything really doesn't work. All right, so that's where zero trust comes into play. All right, let me just get rid of this. If you look at zero trust, right, if you, if I have to probably write down a couple of things about zero trust, the whole objective of zero trust is what? To prevent data breaches, right? That's, that's what you want to do. You want to prevent any kind of data breach which is happening in your network because nowadays we all know that data is the most important entity in an organization right and how do you want to do this right that's that's the next question right how do you want to do this and one of the important principle of zero trust is that you should never trust and always verify right so if you this is one thing which i want you to take out of this video right if you forget everything else Always remember, when you talk about zero trust, one of the most important fundamental principle is that never trust and always verify, right? So this is supremely important. And how, and then, you know, we can also talk about how you can do it, right? Obviously, you know, segmentation comes into play, right? When I talk about segmentation, I mean to say segmentation, doing macro and micro segmentation, right? At every layer, at every application, right? so that you can kind of prevent any kind of lateral movement you know which we just now saw in an example earlier right putting putting think of it as this way putting a next generation firewall in front of every protect surface right so something on that sort right so having some kind of segmentation of that sort will really help right so these are predominantly the principles of zero trust right another important principle which you probably hear a lot you know, in most of the marketing content and so on, when you hear about zero trust is least privileged access, right? Let me just write it down here, least privileged access, right? So once you have kind of like segmented your network, it's very important to kind of maintain this because if you're segmenting your network, but then if your policies, if your security policies are not crisp and granular, right? Then there is no point. I mean, um, you know, segmentation will basically go for a wage. So having this principle or using this principle of least privileged access where you, where, where you have different types of security policies for say employees versus contractors, making sure you just give access to resources which are needed for that particular person and not open up all the access, right? So least privileged access is more of an add on, you know, once you're done with your whole segmentation of the network. That being said, do you think zero trust is something, you know, I mean, we, we have outlined a bunch of things here, what we want to achieve, what it is about, but do you think zero trust is something out of the world? No, right? It's, it's not like a new technology, right? And in fact, if any vendor out there claims that they, they have a solution in place to make you zero trust overnight, don't believe them, right? That's, that's not how it is, right? It's, it's a journey 
to get to you know the end state but it's a journey right there is no one single product which you can or one single solution which can claim that look they can make your organization zero trust right so when you talk about the uh, you know at the end of the day you know uh, if you if you kind of like strip down zero trust right at the end of the day you have just two things what are those one is what do you want to protect right i i like to call it protect surface okay so this is one thing and the other one is the tools which you want to protect them with right so let's call them as i don't know maybe protection tools right at the end of the day it all boils down to these two things right and this has been there not just in zero trust but in your traditional security model as well right you had a bunch of things which you wanted to protect that those were your protect services right it could be things like what networks devices right your applications data infrastructure right identities right all of these different things right which you wanted to kind of protect and then you have your protection tools right i mean the most prominent one in today's world is a next generation firewall right but at the same time that doesn't uh, that's just that's just not it right there are different other tools as well you have things like uh, you know um, maybe uh, maybe a cloud cloud delivered firewall or maybe it could be a mfa right multi factor authentication right um, and a bunch of other things bunch of other tools which will probably look into while we are talking about Uh, while we are doing the lab, but yeah, at the end of the day, you know, if you talk about zero trust, these are the two predominantly, you know, the two different candidates, uh, and they still exist. They have been existing in our old security paradigm and in zero trust as well. They still exist, right? It's not zero trust doesn't mean that you have you have some new type of uh, you know um, things which you want to protect. At the same time, it's um it also doesn't mean that you have some new tools right it's the same old thing but how do you use it how do you use it to protect your surface with this whole new principles which we just now talked about that that's what changes with zero trust right so just to drive that point let me actually take a very simple example right so a very simple example which would be something like uh, let's say we use a different color let's say you are you are an engineer right you are sitting here you are an engineer working for a reputed company right and you you have an application right so you have an application over here an app it could be any type of app maybe you are a if you are not an engineer maybe you are a sales guy it might be a sales app or a marketing app whatever right you have an app as of today if you see um you know one of the predominant way of accessing this app and I'm, uh, this app again can be in a public cloud private cloud let's for example assume it is on premise right it's in a private cloud in your data center of your company right as a employee how do you access it right as of today predominantly you do it with what using a let me put a tunnel to kind of give you an idea obviously vpn right you connect through a vpn and as soon as you connect through a vpn you connect to a say a firewall head end and then you know um once you are in the network you are just given access to the application that's that's predominantly how it works now if you want to kind of move this to a zero trust because i already kind of talked about the problems with traditional perimeter security right just putting a firewall in the middle and then trusting everything that goes after the firewall is not a good way to go about things so if you want to kind of move this to a zero trust uh you know uh principle right if you want to apply zero trust principles what would you do right we'll actually do this example later in the lab but just to kind of give you an idea right what you can end up doing is you can probably put a when I mean, we call it as proxy right or a gateway and stuff like that right different organizations different vendors call it different so you have you can put a proxy over here right and right and now that you have a proxy we can get rid of the firewall sorry the vpn vpn is no longer needed you can access this proxy from your internet as well right um because what really what 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 actually happens in the background is that now when you try to connect to this app you first end up con- contacting the proxy right the proxy can then be integrated with a sso solution right a single sign on solution right and single sign on generally has what it has things like an idp right uh, identity provider right and you do a single sign on 
and then on top of that you know the uh, proxy can be integrated with the mfa solution right multi factor authentication right so when you are when you are doing a saml sso right the authentication piece can be taken care by a you know uh, mfa right you have many mfa solutions like ping duo and so on so when you are doing this mfa you also have uh, uh, opportunity to kind of make sure that this user from wherever they are trying to access right you can put in some policies you can make sure that person's laptop or the phone or whatever they are trying to access this app is compliant right you can make sure that the um, you know when i say compliant you can you, there are a couple of things you can make sure that the phone or laptop is managed you can make sure that uh, you know it is compliant with the latest you know software and hardware um, requirements right make sure that they have some uh, antivirus in place and so on so you are continuously monitoring and making sure that the device through which they are trying to access is free of malware right is free of any kind of ransomware is free of any kind of you know attack right and once all of that is validated you can then provide access to the application right and then this is not a one time process right this is it's not like okay you just quickly va validate and you know then you don't do anything so this will happen continuously in a periodic way so when you even when you are accessing the application right you can and obviously you will have some kind of a you know firewall in place over here between the proxy and the application as well which will give you that layer 7 protection right so see how we have kind of like transformed from you know a simple vpn tunnel which was just opening up your application to the user without any further checks right right now we have just taken that and using a very simple solution which is just a sso and a mfa we have kind of provided much you know security and we have provided the zero trust principles for this particular application right whatever i told you again just now here this is just a you know glimpse of it right we can do much more stuff but that's that's the whole idea of zero trust right so all the solutions which i just now mentioned here be it this layer 7 firewall be it this proxy sso mfa these are not new solutions they have been there around for a quite some time how you we kind of like put them together to achieve the zero trust principles that's that's what makes it special all right so now that we have a little bit of understanding of zero trust these are a couple of probably assignments or um, you know extra reading material which i would like to give it to you guys i would suggest you guys to probably explore uh, because zero trust like i said uh, it's been a buzzword since the last I don't know, maybe five, six years, right? So there are many organizations out there which have tried their own ways of implementing it. And I would suggest you to explore or read about maybe Microsoft's journey, right? There is There are good white papers out there where they have clearly explained how they have done it, you know, but what phases, because like I said, it's a journey, right? At the end of the day, it's not something which you can do overnight, right? Um, designing the architecture and making sure what solutions, you know, help, with your architecture, right, B building that design and doing it in a phased approach, right, that's very important and you have different organizations out there doing it in a different way. So Microsoft is a very good, uh, you know, uh, you can you can look them up, uh, look their, uh, you know, white papers and explore to understand more. Uh, the other one is obviously Google, right, um, Google's, uh, again, Zero Trust, they generally like to call it uh, Beyond Cop. Right. So th their journey is also pretty cool. They were actually one of the f first uh, companies out there to implement it. And from my memory, if I can recollect, right, how did they do it? Again, I'll just put a quick stick diagram here. <clears throat> so in their in their solution or in their way of deploying zero trust, right, they had what we call as uh, data sources, right. So they had data sources. What is data sources? Because if you want to implement zero trust for the whole organization. One of the most important thing is you need to have the inventory, right? You need to make sure what all devices are there in my organization, be it laptops, be it workstations or phones or, um, you know, if you think of a campus organization, you're going to have things like cameras, right? You're going to have things like, um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, workplace resources, right? Maybe uh, thermostats and like a bunch of devices. So you need to have an inventory, you need to have a source of data which kind of which is dynamic and keeps track of all these devices, right? All this inventory. So that's just one example, but then there are many other data sources as well, right? Which will help you uh, with your uh, zero trust, which is say certificate authorities, the PKI part and so on, right? So 
data sources, right? I'm just putting all of them in one. The next is the most important part, which is what they called it as, I believe it, they call it as access intelligence, right? I'm gonna put it as AI. <laughs> it's not artificial intelligence, it's AI, access intelligence, right? And this is where, you know, you kind of define the trust which we spoke about, right? So this is, this is the engine, let's call it as an engine, which continuously, right, feeds on this data sources, right? So this data sources is kind of fed into this engine and it continuously tries or to analyze the state of the device, right? It checks, okay, the device is running the latest software, latest hardware, okay? Uh, it's, it's probably having the latest, um, you know, malware protection in place and so on. So based on that, you know, it can then figure out a score, right? It can figure out a trust score, right? So that's how the Beyond Corp or the Zero Trust Engine of Google is able to figure out, okay, look, the data coming from here, you know, the this particular user is using this particular device and, you know, it is, it's probably compliant. Maybe we can trust it, right? Because, because of certain factors. There's no blindly trusting. There is continuous evaluation which happens using the data coming out of the devices, using the agents which are running out of these inventory, these various devices and the uh, AI engine or the access intelligence is able to kind of come up with a trust score for, you know, for these devices which are there on the network. So once, once it comes up with that trust score, then it also assigns some kind of a security clearance for that device, right? If you, if you look at how uh, defense organizations have their uh, security structure in place, right? They have confidential stuff, highly confidential stuff, and you know they have different hierarchies, right? So if you, uh, you know, if 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 they trust you, or if you are at a very high position in the organization, then you are given access to some of the most, you know, highly confidential stuff in the world, right? So similarly, this access intelligence basically does that. It continuously figures out the trust score of the device, and then. Uh, not just the device, the user and all of that, and then kind of also assigns the maximum, you know, security uh, level, right? Based on the, obviously the policies which are configured on it, um, you know, uh, the maximum security um, trust or the maximum, um, uh, uh, the security tire which they can access. And then you have obviously the other part which is like what we spoke about just earlier right you have gateways now the gateways can be anything it can be things like uh, you know proxy which we just now spoke about or it could be a network switch or a router uh, or a jump host to which you do a ssh it could be a console server right all of that right basically the device through which you access your resource that's your gateway right it could be a proxy right as simple as that and finally on the right you have your resources which you are trying to protect Right now, Google being a predominantly a software company, I'm pretty sure they have uh, thousands and thousands of you know GitHub repositories and uh, I don't know maybe CI/CD pipelines and uh, bug trackers and bunch of things which they use to run their business. Right, so those would basically come on the uh, resources side of things, and that's what you're trying to protect. Right, that's that's the whole principle of zero trust which we sp spoke about. Right, we want to prevent data breach. Correct. So that's that's what you're trying to protect. Those are your resources. All right, so that, that was the structure. And obviously, where do you come? You probably come here, like as a user. If you're a user working, um, you know, in Google, right? If you're a, maybe an employee or a contractor or you maybe are a partner, you basically come and access these resources through the gateway, right? And as soon as you make an access, um, you know, uh, obviously the gateway will have to talk to the, um, you know, access engine to figure out um, you know, uh, based on the policy, based on the authorization policy, based on based on what you, um, based on the devices you're trying to access, based on the user who is trying to access, uh, the location from where they're accessing, right? So all of this information is then used to make the decision and then the gateway will either provide you access or not, right? So, but then you see throughout this design, what is really happening is, there is no implicit trust, right? Every single user, you be an employee, you're a contractor, partner, every single user at all point of time, you're verifying that you you really have that access, right? Verifying, you know, um, um, continuously, and then the access is provided, right? And it's not that once you've provided the access, that's it. No, there will be a continue, the engine will still keep on running because there is always a possibility that, you know, at time t equals, you know, uh, T1, you got the access and you went, you went ahead and you're, 
uh, browsing your resources but then you know at t equals t2 you might have been inflict, you know uh, infected with the malware so the system should quickly remove or revoke your access as well right so all of this happens continuously and that's that's the whole cool part about you know zero trust so these two things and maybe the third one which i would also suggest you guys to look up is the nist uh, you know framework right so the nist is an organization and they they have put up a framework for zero trust as well again it is it doesn't talk about any specific vendor it's just uh, lists out basically the uh, principle which i kind of went through in the last uh, 20 15 20 minutes but in a more formal and in a more uh, you know uh, structured way all right let me clean up my board here Okay, just want to spend a couple of minutes on strategy, right? Now, um, again, zero trust strategy is something, uh, uh, I mean, we can, we can obviously talk about a blueprint of sort, but at the same time, um, the granular piece of this will obviously depend, and it'll, be, it'll depend purely on the organization and purely on the network and uh, what's, what type of IT they have, right? Uh, but yeah, the blueprint would be, I mean, if, if anyone is exploring uh, to do zero trust, right, the strategy should be something of this sort, right? Uh, figuring out what is your protect service. We spoke about what is protect service, right? And in case of uh, one of the, I think if you, uh, I mean, uh, if you if you have trouble remembering what are the various things, you can just remember DAS. What does DAS stand for? D stands for devices. Uh, sorry, D stands for data. A for applications. Uh, another A for assets and S for services. Services could be like protocols, connectivity protocols and so on, right? So this is basically your protect service. Okay, let me just write it down so that you don't forget. So protect service, right? Figuring out what is your protect service, right? If I have to put everything which organization is, because it, you pick any organization, these are the four things they would want to protect, right? The data, the applications, assets and the services, right? So making a list of everything, defining that for your organization, that's very important, right? Where you want to deploy this zero trust. Next is uh, flows, trying to understand the flows, right? Transaction flows predominantly because, you know, you, you have, like I spoke, these are the four things, four product services, right? How do they interact with each other? Right? How, do, how does the data talk to the applications, right? On which assets have the applications, as, uh, you know, accessed? Right, what services are provided by the application? So all this, trying to understand how this four, you know, or, or basically how does your protect surface interact with each other? That's very important as well, because that will help you define those define segmentation, which is actually my next step, which is what probably thinking about having, um, you know, uh, having some kind of a segmentation or let's just call it as uh, architecting, you know, zero trust right the architecture part that's important so once you have done your discovery which is part two steps then coming up with an architecture right and one of the most common tool which is used in this regard is your next generation firewall right because why again i mean uh, i like calling it next generation firewall because it includes everything it has your layer 7 application filtering it has your uh, things like ips ideas and everything put in place but doesn't have to be for you right you might be using a firewall you might be using a separate ideas ips and you know uh, probably might be doing a bit of cloud security and so on which is great right whatever works for you right but these are the tools which can help you do certain things like your segmentation part put in those layer 7 access control and so on so that's important so once you've figured out product surface once you've mapped your flows next you need to think about you know where you know, at, at, at which locations I want to enforce the access control and what tools I can use to do that. So once you've figured out your tools and architecture part, the next is obviously figuring out the policy part, right? The policies are very important. And, um, you know, in the, in the olden days, in the traditional model, right? Again, uh, back in the day when you did not have application firewalls and stuff, the policy was mainly concerned about two things, who and where. Right, because this was mainly what L3 and L4 protection, right? L3 and L4. So, who is trying to access, right? And where, what you are trying to access. So, the source and destination, right? That was predominantly and probably the ports, right? Source port, destination port, uh, the source, pro the protocol is a TCP, UDP. So, these were few things which you just filtered on, or your policies were dependent only on this. 
But what has changed right over the years is that these two questions are not enough. You need to also ask questions around what you are trying to access, right? That's your application layer seven, right? When is the access, right? When is it? I mean, now imagine if if a particular employee always locks in at nine o'clock and you know locks off by five o'clock, right? And suddenly you see an access coming at two o'clock in the night at two a.m. You know that is suspicious, right? So trying to do some kind of baselining and making sure that the access, you know, you are providing access to the resource, um, you know, at a very um, uh, not at a very odd time, right? Again, would depend upon application to application and organization to organization, but you know that's another point to consider. Why is the access coming? Why does the user does the user has have entitlement to this resource, right? Are they supposed to access? right or if not you know understanding the why part and the other one is probably the how as well right how is the access coming right or, you know is it being accessed from a phone is it from a laptop and so on so answering these questions right really helps and to do this you know you really need that next generation firewall right that layer 7 capability is what you want right so the policy part like i said see i mean we spoke about the architecture we spoke about the policy but again this is these things have not been invented for zero trust alone these have been there around for quite some time right we are just putting them in a structure so that you can achieve the best out of it right and the last one i would say is uh, monitoring any system you develop any architecture you develop you need to have some kind of monitoring in place right so monitoring and you know uh, monitoring continuously right that's supremely important right because i said you know you do all these things you do you did all these evaluations you made sure that the device uh, you know the user and everyone has entitlement to access they are accessing from the correct place and all of that but then if you don't do the monitoring piece what would end up happening is that you know while the user is trying to access a resource you know he might get infected with something right and then you know that might again cause the same problem which we had in the past lateral movement and so on so continuous monitoring is important making sure that you're continuously checking that the device is compliant it doesn't have any you know iocs right indicators of compromise and so on that's supremely important and that is what um, you know you can um, use to kind of give a nice close look to your zero trust strategy all right um, I think we can wind up this with few use cases, right? So let me just clean my board, right? So when you talk about use cases of zero trust, right? I'll just probably list obviously a few which have been buzzing in the last one, two years, right? But there are obviously quite a lot of other use cases as well. One thing which a lot of people have been working on is multi-cloud, right? So multi-cloud, right? it's a bit tricky with multi-cloud, right? Why? Because you have a user here, right? In case of multi-cloud, uh, and again, I mean, you might have different types of users, right? Maybe you have a developer, you have a, I don't know, customer or a partner, whatever. You have different types of users. And in case of multi-cloud, you have different types of cloud providers over there, right? That's the whole idea. You probably have some services running in AWS, Google, uh, Azure, and so on. So kind of implementing zero trust in this kind of a scenario is pretty tricky, but architecting is very important, right? So whenever you talk about zero trust, right, there are two key terms which people always use. They call it as decision point and enforcement point, right? So in this one, where will the, the whole thing is, first thing you need to figure out is where would you want to put the decision point? Right? Decision point is very similar to what I explained earlier. Like think of that as the access intelligence, right? So the the think of it as a black box or an engine which is making which is going to have all those unified policies, authorization policies in place, which will tell what this guy is entitled to and what this one is not. Right? So that is very important. Now, because you have this multi-cloud scenario, right, you, you can think of putting this decision point either in one of the cloud itself or you can probably put it outside the cloud you can probably put it on premise right but building this building this and putting it somewhere is supremely important the next is obviously enforcement point like i said right now the enforcement point 
mostly what they do is they kind of try to do it on the cloud itself because the reason being different cloud providers have their own way to enforce certain things right you have those security groups in aws similar you have something else for gcp and azure right so once you have made the decision should this user be provided access to i don't know maybe a ec2 instance which is running here right once that decision has been made it has to be enforced right so this decision point will need to continuously talk to the enforcement point and kind of implement those right uh, uh, and so that's why you know they generally deploy the enforcement point inside the cloud itself right but you see this is a very good use case now with this whole strategy in place what you can actually do is you can have different type of personas coming to your organization it could be your employees it could be your customers it could be your partners and they will have you know continuously their authorization entitlements will be verified right and then based on based on their access you know they will be provided access and again continuous monitoring and all of that is in place which will kind of help you to achieve your zero trust right um, or get on with the journey of zero trust the other use case which people talk about is uh, let me just clean my board is probably mobile devices right uh, again this is a very common use case because why because uh, uh, mobile devices right because most of us do a lot of activities a lot of our work things on the phone nowadays right and if you look at uh, different organizations they have different uh, let's say uh, policies right people have something called as byod bring your own device people have uh, you know corporate owned uh, you know or corporate uh, there is something called C cop and then there is something called cyod as well so basically the whole idea is that you can either bring your own phone or in some cases you know you have the corporate people they are going to um, you know they are going to provide you the phone right or in the other case you can also have uh, uh, certain phones which you can procure yourself but they should be approved by the corporate right but in either of this right the whole idea is that when you bring such kind of devices it's it becomes little tricky because generally in mobile phones you have something called mdm management right mobile device management so you have a separate system which will manage all your phones and uh, you know it can make your phone as managed unmanaged at any point of time and so on but but trying to um, you know support all kind of vendors all type of models all type of different software versions is actually a bit of a headache right and doing zero trust here is also pretty you know tricky right in case of byod what you can do is you can put in something like a because it's a byod right you really don't have any visibility on the device it's just a random device which has come into your network what you can do is you can put like a captive portal right uh, and enclave gateway of sort and in that gateway you can probably do few things right the user when they come and connect to the network they'll be redirected to the portal and on the portal you can do some validation you can make you can scan the device to make sure it it is uh, harmless you know to some extent uh, you know you can figure out what it is running and get a fingerprint of the device and if everything checks out then you can provide access to some limited resources you know which which you think are fine right so things like that whereas in case of corporate owned device or corporate provided devices what you can also do is because they are approved by the corporate which means that they they can you know work with this mdm so sometimes what you can do is you can deploy some agents on those devices right which will end up as the policy enforcement points right just like how we spoke about the cloud earlier so this is another use case which you know different vendors uh, are trying to solve right the mobile devices and probably just to round it off the other one which you probably hear is the work from home right because there are like literally i mean after the pandemic you know the world has started moving towards the whole hybrid work scenario where you have a lot of people a lot of employees out there who are going to start working from home or are working from home continuously and uh, you know we have always used vpn right to make it happen right the example which i showed you earlier right but in the problem with vpn like i said is that you you can't you can't do anything about the lateral traffic right once you enter the vpn you can't put in you can't do any kind of checks on you know what is what is the user you know trying to access right laterally that's that's difficult and that's really critical when you have devices infected 
and uh, the other part being in VPN, you just authenticate once, right? And then you can just keep that VPN turned on for the whole day. So you don't really know. I mean, technically, I can probably connect. I can be connected to the VPN, right? And then maybe when I went to grab some coffee, right? Maybe someone else might come to my laptop and probably do something else, right? Connect to a GitHub repository, internal repository, and kind of delete it or something like that, right? Because it is all based on perimeter defense it's 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 not a very uh, you know full fledged very secure zero trust solution right so that's where zero trust can come into play and we can use things like proxies and stuff which i showed you earlier where you can do a continuous you know authorization put in those granular policies make sure that the you are monitoring the users continuously um, you know um, and obviously prevent lateral movement as well right so <clears throat> That's, that's another use case which people explore with Zero Trust, right? And there are many more, right? Thousands, I mean, probably tens different types of use cases which I would recommend you to explore uh, after checking out this video, right? So now we have kind of got a roundup about what Zero Trust is and a bit on the strategy side, couple of examples, couple of use cases and so on. I think now we are good to kind of pick our dcloud lab and Take, take this unique use case, right, which we have with this particular fictitious organization and we'll try to do, uh, we'll try to implement some solutions for this organization, right, and we'll see how we will be achieving uh, or we will, we will get this organization, you know, on their journey of zero trust. All right, so um, before we get to the lab, let me just give you an idea about, you know, what this whole, uh, you know, uh, example looks like right so think for example we have a let me grab my pen right think of think think of this as a typical organization right so you I'm calling it as uh, uh, I don't know bits please limited right and they want to implement or they want to get on with their zero trust journey um, they have a headquarters they have a SD1 branch they have few roaming users right typical you have generally a campus or a centralized site with a data center in place then you have branches all over the world and then you have people accessing the network through some roaming users it's a very typical use case of any organization if you take into effect right so um, and i think the diagram is pretty self-explanatory right what we are trying to do um, like i said this I, I have not constructed this lab i'll be using a dcloud lab so we will not be talking uh, we will not be talking uh, the networking part of it a lot we'll just concentrate on the zero trust and the security piece in place right so to begin with what we will try to do is we'll probably <coughs> explore how we can so i've just shown so this is the van and it has a breakout to the internet so i've just shown you how people can connect to it and then i've also represented sas here because most of our applications nowadays are sas based right Anyway, so what we'll do is, uh, step number one is here, right? What we'll try to do is we'll uh, look at, we'll pick one or two applications. I think maybe it's just one application. Uh, in this example, it is actually an application which is sitting here in the data center. So maybe this application, right, which is in the web server. Uh, so we'll pick one application, uh, uh, but the same idea can apply to a SaaS application as well. Right, and we'll show how we can implement something like a SSO, single sign-on, right, using SAML. Right, we'll implement that. Uh, so that will kind of, uh, kind of help help understand how we can kind of like streamline the user experience, right? Because in single sign-on, what happens? You can sign in to one application only once, and then you can you don't have to really sign into again and again to different applications, right? It really helps with the experience, right? But while you are doing that single sign-on, we'll explore how we can do things like uh, trusted endpoints, right? Uh, that is how can you provide access to only those endpoints which are managed right which are company devices and which are not how you can continuously monitor the device health that's something we'll check how to do mfa multi-factor authentication right so this is going to be single sign-on with multi-factor authentication right using your phones <coughs> um, and then we will also look into how we can establish this whole least privileged access role-based access right so you know, whereas we, we can fine tune the policies, we can give greater level of, um, you know, uh, access to the employee and probably if you want, you can give less level of access to contract, all that controls you can take care, right? So that's, that's like one piece of it. 
the next is probably we will also uh, like i said this is a very unique this is a very one specific use case right where we have taken this headquarters branch and roaming so this would definitely whatever i'm showing here the solutions here will will not work as is to all organizations this will clearly need the strategizing and uh, you know uh, figuring out what the the strategy which we spoke about right we will need to obviously customize this and figure out what solutions will work for you will help you on your journey uh, but these are just the ones you know for this particular organization um, and based on their you know requirements right cool so uh, that being said the next is vpn right so we we would still want to provide vpn for these the roaming users who are sitting here right but at the same time we want to make the vpn a bit secure and add single sign on right with mfa so that's something which we'll explore because say, i mean i did speak about vpn not being a great solution but at the same time um, it's it's not it's not wrong to implement vpn right you might still need again a vpn to to for some of your use cases right that there, there might be no other way to do it because uh, your reverse proxies and all of that work for certain type of protocols but it might not work for all the protocols so you might need some vpn in place um, you know and you can still use it uh, provided you know you can uh, strengthen your authentication putting some mfa with single sign on that really helps that will explode then we will do um, reverse proxy right i spoke about proxy earlier uh, you know because we are talking about the vpn less world so how can you take another we pick we'll pick one more web application which is there on the headquarters and we'll try to put a proxy so i think in case of we'll be using duo for this and we'll call this as dng right that's the proxy network gateway i think it's called um, and uh, that's what we'll be implementing right we'll use a dng as a reverse proxy and we will protect uh, certain uh, enterprise applications right then we will integrate this duo with the sso as well right so duo with sso and obviously mfa and then we'll talk about duo central which is a, a very interesting uh, it's just a feature but just want to call out how simplifies it simplifies your job um, the next is we will also talk a little bit about um, umbrella right we'll talk about umbrella because why now we we kind of we have talk, we talked about vpn and then we went to vpn less world right so when you talk about vpn less you no longer have you are no longer on the corporate network so you no longer have any firewalls you know um, in the organization so you are you really when you're using when you're using something like um, you know proxy what you are doing is you are accessing the application directly on the internet so you would want to protect your asset your laptop or whatever it is with some kind of security solution so this umbrella is basically a cloud security solution you can go back to my channel and look up umbrella in detail i have done few videos on it in the past but we'll explicitly look at the secure web gateway and how you can use umbrella to provide cloud security right how you can deploy this uh, uh, swg any connect client using asa that's something we'll explore we'll look into umbrella policies right and uh, finally um, we'll also look at how you can integrate um, you know cisco secure endpoint that's basically amp right in the in the past we used to call it amp it's now renamed as cisco secure endpoints we'll look at how you can integrate this duo with secure cisco secure endpoint right uh, so that was that was again you know a bunch of again solutions in place uh, to kind of improve right or to get on the zero trust journey um, mainly for remote workers i would say right mainly for people who are trying to access the first use case was obviously it can be for remote or people accessing from the campus within the campus imagine a client sitting here within the branch or within the headquarters or within the branch anyone could use it whereas coming to the second set of solutions we are going to mainly look at for the remote remote people right who are accessing stuff on their phones and laptops sitting somewhere in different part of the world and the third one will be again mainly concentrated on the branch side of things so how we'll explore how uh, again there is another term which you might have heard in the in the last one two years right sasi which has become very prominent right sasi is basically how you can kind of unify network and security right and kind of give a consistent experience for people who are accessing your network right and the applications in a very network in a very secure way right how can you unify these both that's what uh, you do with sasi and here we'll be using sd wan right the viptel sd wan to achieve this right so we will we'll basically end up creating from this branch we'll end up creating a ipsec tunnel all the way to umbrella and all the traffic which are which is going to go out of that branch you know we will be able to secure it using umbrella security 
right? So, and thereby you can provide a consistent experience as well, right? So that any any user who is in this branch, right, will be able to kind of comply with that policy and the unified policy will be deployed for all of them, right? So that's something we'll explore as well. So yeah, I think the use cases are pretty straightforward, right? And uh, that's something which we want to explore. Uh, let's see, I might break this into multiple videos or probably make a new set of videos. So uh, yeah, um, let's get on with that.